Um, yeah, I'm glad I did it. I've had an interesting 20 years. Yes, you, madam. Yeah, um, I'm curious to know what effect do you think um, the, the, uh, an aspect of the environmental movement of an intentional primitivism and going back to direct experience in nature has, how will that inform this electronic Disney culture? Well, you know, it was funny. Um, first of all, I'd say it's just romanticism, and it's, it's typical that whenever you get a new technology, the old one is put in quotes, and that's, you see the old, and you don't see the new. It's like in the age of freeways and uh, television in the 50s, what you go into when you see Disney World is a 1910 small town with clop, clop, clop horses and streetcars and soda fountains and, and American 1910, right as it's taking off Henry Adams style to become a world, a, a world uh, power. So that's always the paradox that whenever you move into a new technology, you uh, sentimentalize and create an artifact in nostalgia for nature and you return to nature. You don't return to nature, you return to an idea of nature. So what happened in the, in the 70s, everybody returned to nature in utopian communities, but they became very regressive and sort of got exploded because infantile dynamics of the nuclear family got projected onto the, the mother, mom and pop who were ever in charge of the community. And there were all kinds of, of psychodrama played out, whether it was The Farm and Steve Gaskin or Finn Horn or Linda's Farner Zen Center in San Francisco. All of those got involved in kind of infantile psychodynamics and they were regressive and neo, you know, sort of neo-neolithic. They weren't really uh, futuristic. At the same time, they were saying, we are the evolutionary you know, avant-garde. So I, I see those as fairly reactionary. Nature, I don't think, really, there is anything called nature. I think nature is the horizon of culture. When we say nature, we see Sierra Club, uh, you know, pictures, Elliot Porter, which come from Constable and Coro in Gainsborough and come from the Gentleman's Park, which gave us Olmsted Central Park in the middle of New York. That's an idea of nature. We don't think of toxic dumps in New Jersey. But I mean, if you got down to the molecular level and you danced with the electrical sound and light show of a toxic dump in New Jersey, it could be the most beautiful thing you'd ever experience. But it's not in our horizon of what we want to call natural. Or if you got out to supernovas or colliding galaxies, it would be so horrendously unnatural and terrifying that we wouldn't want to call it natural. So nature is our horizon. We like mammals better than cockroaches, things of this sort. And so when we go back to nature, we don't think of going to cockroaches in Manhattan. We think of going to the Rockies in Colorado, which of course is what I did. <laughs> yes, sir, you have no chance. Will you please define aromatic technology and any examples of like, that Lindisfarne project of the biosphere on St. John, <coughs> something like that? Now, aromatic is a special thing that um, it's a mythological system that Steiner has developed. I, uh, it's a sort of dialectic in which the Christ is in the middle as the mediation of two opposites, the collectivization and non-individuation of Aramad, which is a kind of demonic, devilish figure, and the exaltation of the individual to cosmic, uh, solipsistic, autistic forms, like in Milton's Paradise Lost, Lucifer says, one step further makes me highest. And so the, the notion that you can be a self uh, escaping into ecstasy is the Luciferic dimension. And the other, where everything is Stalinistically compressed into no individuality in the Aramonic. And for him, the mediation of the myth of, in Western culture of individuation is the Christ. And he did a sculpture in, in um, Dornach in which uh, Araman and Lucifer are wrestling with the Christ. It's a, it's a whole mythological trope that Steiner has developed in his life. And there is a book uh, called Lucifer and Araman of lectures that he gave in Bern in about 1906. But basically, Araman, he, and he also made predictions that, um, I think in some of his lectures he said that Lucifer had a human incarnation in China in about the third millennium BC. So in Flash Gordon, the Ming figure, is really, Flash Gordon is basically Pop Steiner, you know. The way we Americans experience high Germanic mysticism is through comic books. And so if you did a cultural history of the Wizard of Oz and Flash Gordon and Superman and um, Captain Marvel and the Fabulous Four, which is another version of the subtle bodies, the, the Fantastic Four is the subtle body architecture, you could, um, you could show how America took the European high culture and democratized it through the comic book and made 
smuggled in through customs mysticism in comic book form. That's part of our kind of genius, and now we do it in movies, but it's, uh, it's, it has deep roots. The Wizard of Oz is just totally an esoteric allegory of individuation and the subtle bodies. At any rate, that's a long uh, answer. The, um, he has, uh, so Ming is Lucifer, and he has a prediction that now, toward the year 2000, Araman will take a, a collective incarnation in America in the New World. And so you'll find Steiner people who hate electronics, and when they raise their kids, say, you can't have stereos, you shouldn't watch television, that television and stereos are evil, <gasps> no computers, you know. Uh, so there, it's an intense battleground of good and evil. How are we doing for time? You should pull the plug whenever you want to. I'll go on all night. I mean, you know, five minutes. Okay. Yes. A couple questions. What's meta business? Meta business. That's a good question. It's so good a question. I don't have a fast answer for it, uh, which shows it's really a good question. Um, when you say meta business, what I what I tend to think of is Lawrence Rockefeller, who is this. A uh, meta businessman who's funded the whole alternative movement and created, na you know, national parks and all over the country and Buddhist monasteries and has this kind of like a Renaissance prince. He's almost like sort of the way the Medici's were to uh, Ficino in, in Renaissance Florence. So that the purpose of of amassing capital is not to amass capital, but to empower a civilizational vision. You know, and so. Uh, Ordinary business is just make a buck, quarterly report, wealth. Uh, meta business is empowering a vision where, where the amassing of capital is for another, another purpose. That, that would be a, a tentative answer to it. I think America is trying to figure out and embody. And they, the yuppie generation in the 80s uh, were sort of mini business, you know, and it got to be really very tight focus of wealth. And now it seems, you know, it's like the 70s were sort of flipped out, spacey, and ungrounded. And the 80s were ground and no space. You know, it was it was Dynasty in Dallas, and we had Star Trek. Now I hope 90s are going to be the dialectical synthesis, and we're going to get really grounded mysticism, and a real politics that'll be a Gaia politique, which is what I've tried to argue for in the in the books. But I don't see it yet. <laughs> you know, it's wishful thinking on my part. Yeah. I have another question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in studying Gaia politique. Now you've said that that there's not. From your experience, it's not one place where it's being studied, but it's in a number of places. Yeah. Where would you recommend um, a student, an upcoming student, go to? What, what directions? Well, the way I've tried to, um, let's say, be a teacher of Gaia Politique is not to do it in a university, but to do it uh, in the cathedral at the edge of Columbia in the ghetto in, uh, in Spanish Harlem in uh, New York at 110th and Amsterdam Avenue because that gives me a mare pattern of overlapping domains that are academic and uh, religious and economic, so that I'm forced to deal with kind of funky things of the homeless and uh, problems that I wouldn't have at, at MIT when I was a professor uh, in uh, St. John the Divine. And so there have been, uh, there have been classes and, and uh, what should we say, symposiums and concerts of ideas on the political implications of Gaia, for example, that we had at St. John the Divine in 1985, in which Lynn Margulis and Lovelock and, and all the people came and explored the political implications, and that's what, what, that's what that became. So that's where I do it. There, but there are, you know, the Eco Party, there are, there are various groups in Berlin and in Germany, although that's gotten very fragmentary now. Uh, it's kind of spread out. I can't think of any one particular place where I could say that's where you'll, you'll find it all together. Yes, sir? Are you going to be doing any seminars or workshops uh, expanding on this out here? At no, no, I'm, I'm just here tonight and then I go see my family in L.A. and then I head back to New York. Nothing in the future time? No, I'm getting tired of travel, so most of my teaching is, is at St. John the Divine, and so that's where I really hang out and, and give a, a, a seminar. But it's a class, you know, it's not like with grades or papers, it's just, you know, very much sort of like this, you know, except the people come for a month. Mm -hmm. You speak about Disneyism as being the universal solvent for the planetary culture. <coughs> and the minute that you postulated that, it raised the question in me, what do you posit as the universal coagulant? No, actually I said that noise was the universal solvent of Renaissance individuality, and not so much that, that Disneyism is. Um, I think the, the importance of the new